bit about this uh, this class. Um, you know, I, I began birding uh, about nine years ago. Um, and uh, I'll just kind of start, start this off with the, the quote down at the bottom. It says, not only was it, or was it my dream, sorry, I put an extra was there, <clears throat> my dream bird, it was possibly the most spectacular creature ever to grace my presence. Um, and this is from Margaret Evans. She's, a, <clears throat> she's an author, uh, editor uh, down um, on the coast of South Carolina. And uh, this was uh, um, kind of tied to a dream that she had about a Baltimore or Oriole um, the, the night before, the day before. So, you know, she dreamed of a Baltimore Oriole and then the next day she actually saw her dream bird. And I just love <laughs> how she said it was possibly the most spectacular creature ever to grace uh, her presence. So, <clears throat> you know, my story is very, very similar. Um, you know, I, I Baltimore Oriole changed my life when I was living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, you know, in, in for five years. And, uh, you know, one day I was just out talking to a buddy of mine, um, you know, on, on the phone, uh, and I was overlooking the garden and a uh, beautiful, beautiful, fiery orange bird flew from my left to right and uh, went went inside and, and Googled it and found out that it was a Baltimore Oriole. And, uh, you know, I, was, I always grew up playing sports. I love the Baltimore Orioles baseball team. I could probably tell you every single person on that baseball team, but I really didn't think twice about it actually being a real bird. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, I saw indigo bunting and I, you know, great crested flycatcher. And now I am leading bird walks um, and talking to people about birds because they're amazing and uh, it can really enrich your life. And uh, you know, just just reading that quote, you can you can see how powerful you know just a, a simple bird that weighs you know next to nothing uh, can be uh, to us. Um, so let's talk about how to become you know a better birder. Um, when I started uh, birding, um, I just practiced all the time. Um, I read as much as I could um, all about birds.org. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, really helped me. Um, I'm just going to read uh, some of what I did. Um, I would find the birds that I didn't recognize by sound. Um, so if I'm sitting in my yard or just wherever I would be and I heard something that I wasn't familiar with, I would go find it. Um, I studied the sounds of birds. Um, I took notes. I wrote down uh, what the sounds sounded like to me. You know, we use mnemonics a lot of time. Um, and I just bird as, as much as possible. We moved back down to South Carolina and I started taking classes uh, with SCWF. Um, if you can bird with somebody or uh, go on a nature walk with somebody that knows more than, than you, um, you can learn a lot. It's just like playing tennis, if anybody's ever played tennis. If you, if you play tennis with somebody uh, of, of equal or lesser um, ability, uh, you're not really going to uh, improve. But if you challenge yourself, you're going to grow, right? So, uh, so go out with somebody that uh, maybe has a little bit more knowledge um, than you. Um, Kind of work at it. Uh, you know, th this isn't something that I just uh, picked up in two days. It's it's taken me nine years to get where I am. Uh, so just know that. Um, and it's been every single day has been enjoyable and uh, and life uh, life giving. So um, uh, we'll we'll go ahead and and, and get into this. Um, so this is me uh, with my son in blue, and his name is Rowan, and he actually has another friend named Rowan. And we were talking about hearing a summer tanager before. And, uh, you know, that's what we were looking at um, right here. So, you know, what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation, this, this picture kind of depicts, you know, look at, look at the habitat. Um, we're on a road, okay? We're in a pretty mature forest, right? There's uh, large trees around. Uh, well, summer tanagers love uh, gaps in forests. Uh, so this kind of, you know, uh, fit, fits the, the, the story for a, for a breeding summer tanager. Um, we're looking, 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 okay? It's not easy, we're communicating, all right? We always have to communicate to find these birds. And then finally, Rowan, who has never, Rowan uh, uh, in the black shirt, the Pokemon shirt, um, he finally was able to see it and uh, put the binoculars on it. And boy, whenever you get a, a nine-year-old kid to go, whoa, um, or wow, because they see uh, a beautiful bird, like a summer tanager, we also, he also saw his first indigo bunting that day. Uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty special day. So um, I don't know. I love these pictures. It kind of shows you that, um, you know, what you have to do to, uh, to find these birds. They're flitting through these leaves. Um, they're quick, they're small, and they can be uh, tough to find sometimes. Uh, so that's the bird that we, we saw, summer tanager, right? 
Um, and we would not have seen that bird, right, if we hadn't uh, heard it first. So we were just walking along and it was just perched, so it wasn't moving, so super hard to, hard to see a bird that's just sitting there, right? But it was telling us that it was there. And this is what it was doing. It was, uh, it was just calling, and uh, maybe the, the individual from Camden heard, heard the same sound. And you'll hear that a lot in South Carolina, but what I want y'all to do, I'm gonna play A, B, and C. Um, so that was the summer tanager's call. Um, I'm gonna play A, B, and C, and I want y'all to uh, guess, um, or um, you know, if you know it, you know, just, just choose the one that it is, uh, which one is uh, uh, summer tanager singing, okay? So I'm gonna just go down the list, A, B, and C. Here's A. And these are all similar, so this is B. And here's C. All right, so if y'all would, um, pick which one you think the, the, is the summer tanager. Um, is the summer tanager A? It was the summer tanager B or was the summer tanager C? And I'll hang tight just for, you know, a few seconds and we'll, we'll see uh, which answers come in. Ooh, we're getting a lot all across the board, Jay. I've got A, B, C. I don't think, I think we might have stumped them. <laughs> all right, well, finally. It's taken, it's taken us, what, six classes or so. <laughs> um, so, you know, I chose songs that are very similar. Um, two of them are tanagers, one's a uh, robin. And if you listen to this one here, B, you'll notice how much uh, clearer, okay, it is than C and A. So let's listen to C. See how raspy that is? And this is kind of in between. Okay, so um, A is the summer tanager. Um, and, you know, probably about five or six years ago after moving back down to South Carolina because they don't get too many um, summer tanagers in, in Pennsylvania, um, I was riding my bike. I like to bike and bird at the same time. Uh, I guess it can be kind of dangerous, but, uh, um, you know, it's a good way to cover a lot of ground. Um, and I just stopped my, I, I stopped my bike and, um, and heard this song and I just, uh, I probably spent five minutes trying to find it. Luckily it just stayed perched and it was singing. I knew it was something that wasn't familiar to me. Um, so that's how I learned it. And you know, every year now we get refreshers because this bird um, like clockwork um, just returns. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to hear almost uh, where I am in Chapin uh, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So um, I chose the ones that are similar just so you could hear the subtle differences. So B is the, it was the robin, a lot clearer, okay? Uh, a was a summer tanager, um, which is a little raspy, um, but has kind of a similar cadence. And then C was the scarlet tanager, which is really raspy, um, though it kind of uh, sounds, you know, very, very, very similar to A and B. Um, another bird that would be uh, similar to those three um, would be a rose-breasted grosbeak, which that would even be, I guess, arguably uh, clearer than, than a robin. Uh, so really good singer, but they all, you know, kind of um, project a, a song that's, that's, that's similar. Um, so, you know, it takes some practice, and I want you, you guys to, to understand that. Um, and, you know, a, a silly joke that I have is that uh, uh, earbuds saved my marriage. And, you know, I used to sit in bed. I guess apparently I thought everybody liked listening to bird songs and bird sounds at 11 p.m. at night, you know, but I was wrong. And my, my wife uh, put earbuds on my chest one night because I was listening uh, out loud, you know, to bird, to bird sounds. So I plugged in the earbuds so I could listen um, and, and wouldn't bother her. But, you know, it takes a lot of practice. I, I didn't do it um, because I wanted to show people how great I was at IDing birds by ear. I did it because I absolutely love it. Um, and uh, again, my point is, you know, it, it just takes work. So if you're fired up about birds and you want to see more, learn those sounds. And we'll go to the next slide here. Uh, so know the habitat. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, 
get to know the location you are birding. Um, are there trails? You know, if you go to some wildlife management areas, uh, I'm a hunter, uh, always have been. And, uh, you know, if you go to these places, um, they'll have a dirt road or, you know, on a paved road, but they won't have trails. Uh, they're fantastic places to bird. Uh, some of the best places around Lake Murray, where I am, um, are game management um, properties. Um, and you don't have, a, have to pay a dime to get on them. Um, maybe, you know, it'd be worthwhile buying a hunting license, even if you don't hunt. Um, to kind of support these places because not only do they support the game uh, that, that people are harvesting, um, they uh, support um, hundreds of different species of, of animals, um, including birds. Um, so, you know, are there trails? Are, um, are there going to be restrooms? Um, what are the hours of operation if there is a gate? Uh, again, you know, a lot of game management properties don't have some, but the Heritage Preserve, some of them do. Um, and they have um, uh, hours of operation. So you can always call the, the biologist who works there to, to, to double check before you go. So you don't you know, spend two hours driving to, just to find out that it's, uh, <laughs> it's closed. Um, is there an entrance fee? Are you gonna go to a state park that might have a small entrance fee or another place? Um, and then talk to friends. Um, I just asked, I, I took a couple people out birding um, not too, too long ago and uh, in a safe way. And um, I asked that they wanted to see a hooded warbler. So I talked to a buddy of mine that had um, uh, birded the, the area a lot more than I had, just to see if there were any locations that that bird, you know, kind of kind of hung out at uh, regularly. Um, but, uh, you know, talk to friends about uh, the, the place that you're gonna bird. They, they might have some great information for you. Uh, we already talked about this one, but listen to bird calls and songs before you go. Uh, learn what birds like to eat. If you want to go see a peregrine falcon, guess what? They eat birds, right? Um, Lake Murray is a, a great place to go. Um, that you know that there's a peregrine falcon in this picture uh, on the top right. That was taken on Lake Murray about a month and a half ago by a buddy of mine, Cameron Foster, who takes wonderful pictures. But um, it it picked that coot. Uh, it's carrying a coot. Um, they pick that coot out of a raft of birds. Um, you know, these coots form these uh, huge rafts on Lake Murray, um, and there can be maybe a thousand coots in one of these rafts. Uh, usually it's a it's hundred to, you know, six, seven, eight hundred birds. Um, so if you find what they like to eat, or if you know what certain birds like to eat, um, you can kind of go to places um, that you know provide their food. Think about a barred owl. Uh, one of the best places to go find a barred owl is Congaree National Park. Uh, you know, uh, one of Bard Owl's favorite snacks is, uh, is crayfish. Um, and if you've ever looked down into the water at, uh, you know, from one of those um, bridges, I guess, um, uh, at Congaree National Park, you'll see uh, loads, dozens and dozens of crayfish. Uh, so, you know, if you haven't seen a Bard Owl, um, once Congaree National Park opens back up, um, it's, it's a fantastic place to go. Um, hey, real quick. Um, yeah. Is we do have a question in the chat box. Is there a particular sound app that you would recommend, especially as you're encouraging people to practice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and I'll get into it a, a little bit more too, but um, Merlin Bird ID, it's free. Uh, it, it, it has a, a probably every bird that you're going to want to find here in South Carolina on the app. Uh, so, upload that. And then it has, you know, you, uh, the pictures of the birds, uh, the map where you can find them, their distribution, and then it also has sounds. Um, they, they borrow or use the same, I, I guess not borrow, but they use the same sounds uh, that allaboutbirds.org uses. Uh, All About Birds might have a few, I, I know they have videos as well, uh, so you might get a little bit extra um, practice material from the actual website, but uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, I think, owns both of them. So uh, Merlin Bird ID is the one that I started out using, and I don't know, it's the, it's the one that I still use, and uh, it's just super easy. It's easy to find birds, and we'll, and we'll talk about that one a, a little bit more, but uh, I would definitely recommend that, and then uh, allaboutbirds.org. Um, let's see, study eBird. Okay, we'll talk about eBird in, in detail and we'll actually go to their website um, if y'all wanna hang out with me and do that. And I, I wanna say that it's probably for me now, uh, the most, uh, the, the, best, the best resource for me to find new birds in the state or find birds that I'm just really interested in. Um, so let's talk, we'll talk about that in depth. We'll uh, kind of surf their website and uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll become a better birder just through the use of that website. Um, 
All right, what else? So bring water, snacks. Uh, if you're uncomfortable out there, you're not gonna stay out there. So make sure, you know, we've got the South Carolina heat coming. It's just been wonderful this year so far, but we've got the heat coming. So bring water, um, bring snacks. Uh, I, I always wear a hiking pack, I, I wear a backpack. Um, I have bug repellent in there. Um, I have bird guides, I have dragonfly guides, I have butterfly guides, you know, all those guides that we, we need, right? There's so many cool things out there. So uh, a pack is fantastic. Um, exercise, we, we birded not too, too long ago, um, just a, a few of us. And uh, at the end of the walk, we, we reported seven miles. So, um, you know, it takes a little bit of, uh, of work, right? And what about warbler neck? Um, if you've ever birded, you know, with someone that loves warblers like me, um, you look up a lot. Uh, you can see these people on the on the bottom right. Um, that was their first ever prothonotary warbler at Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve. Um, <laughs> she she commented that her neck was getting sore. So, you know, you you wouldn't think that you need to work out to be a birder. Um, I don't know, guys. Should we start calling this a sport? Maybe. Um, but you know, uh, at least do some stretches. Um, and hey, listen, if your neck gets sore and the birds are all over the place, I've even laid down to where, <laughs> so your, so your neck, you know, doesn't, doesn't, uh, suffer, you know, afterwards. Um, so, uh, think about that exercise. Uh, you know, we're hibernating all through the winter. Usually we're not too, too active. Um, and so, you know, all of a sudden, we're, we're taking a seven mile walk to go look at birds. So uh, prepare yourself physically. Um, it's something that you might not have thought of. Um, and, and on the opposite end, sit. I love sitting. Um, you know, I grew up hunting, like I said, and some of the coolest things I've, I've ever seen are birds coming to me. Um, I've been in a, uh, in a hunting stand before in a tree and here, those, uh, Hey Shannon, those, those lines, I'm not sure where they're coming from, but I'm going to go to the next slide in a second and see if they uh, clear off. But um, but for right now, I'll, I'll just stay with this slide. Why don't you um, go ahead and actually stop your share and then pull it back up because those fun lines are a Zoom thing, so they'll keep. Oh, okay. All right, so stop share. Technical or... difficulties, everybody. They happen to everyone. All right, so I'm going to go back. All right, they're gone. Um, so on the other side of exercising is just sitting, right? Um, and as a hunter, I've had owls perch, you know, three feet from my, from my head, uh, while I was sitting in a tree. Um, I've had ruby crown kinglets in a duck blind flitting around, you know, uh, my brother and I, it's, it's, it's just a really cool thing to see uh, wildlife come to you. I've had, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, red foxes, uh, walk, walk within 10 feet from me. Um, yeah, one of my favorite birding trips ever, we had a few people come, uh, uh, four four people on a bird walk and uh, we sat down for about 15 minutes and we had a deer you know probably walk 50 feet in front of us we had a hooded warbler that was singing about 15 feet from us and we had a blue gray gnat catcher in the tree right above us um, so sit down for a bit um, and wildlife and the birds uh, of course will come to you um, get a good pair of binoculars and we'll chat about that uh, a little bit more um, some of my favorite, you know, the, I guess the golden hour of, of birding is, uh, or the golden hours are between 7 and, and 10 a.m. Really, really hot uh, uh, in terms of the birds that you're going to see, not the, not the temperature. Um, uh, so get out there early, um, and uh, oftentimes we see birds uh, start again at around 3 p.m., 4 p.m., you know, for, for a couple hours too. So, um, you know, early, early evening, late after, really, really late afternoon can be pretty good. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing one more time to see if I can clear that and I'm going to get back on. All right, so this guy doesn't look too happy, right? Not enjoyable birding. That's what you don't want to do um, or you don't want to have an experience like that. But uh, as birders, I'm assuming most people are birders on this, on this class, but uh, I love this. When you're at a party and nobody wants to talk about birds, uh, this, is from, <laughs> this is from a Netflix series, but the, that's uh, Pablo Escobar right there, or the actor that played him. And that is how I feel when people don't want to talk about birds, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things that you're going to want to do is, is go with a group uh, of people that you enjoy. Um, 
you know, so this is just uh, some, some people, this was from a couple years ago. Um, this was actually a trip for, for somebody's uh, anniversary and a couple other people <laughs> tagged along. Um, but, uh, you know, go with people that you enjoy. Um, there, there are people out there, um, you know, that, that you may uh, not, not enjoy, um, you know, walking around with. Um, and that's not going to, uh, you know, it, it's going to impact your experience negatively. Uh, so make sure you, you find a group that you like um, if you're not just birding by yourself and uh, you'll, you'll have a great time and, and uh, probably end up seeing more birds. Uh, so what to bring? Um, sunscreen. All right. That's probably I probably have three small bottles in my uh, backpack uh, just for other people as well. Um, insect repellent. Uh, food and water, like we said, a map, um, your phone, obviously, which probably has a map already. Uh, a whistle, just for safety, just in case. Um, quality clothes and uh, dress for the weather. You don't want to be, uh, you're not going to enjoy your birding if you have uh, short sleeves on and, and, and uh, shorts and uh, it's, it's 48 degrees out. Um, and what to avoid. You want to avoid too much sun. You don't want to have a heat stroke. Um, you don't want to get too, too hot. Uh, poison anything. Um, I'm super allergic to poison ivy, so I always, always, always wear long pants. Um, uh, mosquitoes and ticks, you know, know where they like to, um, you know, hang out. Um, and then uh, obviously South Carolina, you know, has some dangerous animals. We had, we had an event not too, too long ago here. Um, so, you know, you got to avoid those. And all spiders are evil. So, um, you know, watch out for spiders. But uh, I'm, I'm just joking there. Um, I, I am not a spider fan. If you ever want me or if you ever want to see me dance like Beyonce, just wait until I uh, walk through a spider web and, and you'll see those moves come out. But uh, spiders are fantastic. They're beautiful um, and they are a lot of bird food. Um, so we'll go to the next screen. So you want to know the habitat. I uh, mentioned that, that was the, the first tip that I had a few slides before. Um, you know, we have Bear Island from a trip that we had um, earlier in the year. Um, and, you know, if I'm going there, guess what I'm going to go uh, look for? I'm going to look for uh, shorebirds. I'm going to look for um, wading birds. Uh, they have pelicans down there, the brown and the white. Um, a lot of waterfowl. Uh, so we have this hooded merganser here. Um, and we have uh, the rosette spoonbill. Um, I'm not going to go to probably Sassafras Mountain, um, you know, to, to go look for um, rosette spoonbill. So, uh, you know, Bear Island is fantastic, different habitat down there than we have right here in the, uh, in the Piedmont. Um, this is uh, the one on the bottom right is for, from Sumter National Forest right here in Newberry County. Uh, I think it shares a, a couple, a handful of counties. Um, but that's in Whitmire. And uh, what are we going to find there? We had, uh, I guess, the first prothonotary warbler. We were putting up uh, prothonotary warbler boxes with the uh, uh, U.S. Forestry, um, some, some reps from, uh, from, from their uh, organization. And uh, we had our first prothonotary warbler of the year while we were putting up prothonotary warbler boxes. So that was a pretty cool experience for all of us. Um, but, you know, you could see so many warblers in this type of habitat. You have a little uh, kind of a glade in a uh, in a forest right there. We had a uh, a creek coming through. Perfect, perfect place for uh, warblers. We had uh, northern perulas. We had American red starts. Um, you know, and that was early in the season, uh, early uh, early migration. I think it was back in late March. Um, so you know, you're going to get different birds um, uh, from be between the two places that I've that I just mentioned. Uh, Donnelly WMA uh, Wildlife Management Area in the bottom left is uh, relatively close to Bear Island um, and uh, there we're going to see Eastern Meadowlark. Look at that beautiful uh, um, a picture right there of the Meadowlark and that field. Um, we're going to get bluebirds there uh, probably right now this time of year um, if it's a little bit weedier than that picture is. Uh, you're probably going to get indigo buntings, painted buntings, um, we had, I think, a Vesper Sparrow there that day. So, you know, the different habitats are going to support different birds. And we'll, again, talk about that a little bit more. Um, and you see the barred owl there. Uh, that was taken at Congaree National Park uh, earlier this year. And, uh, you know, that guy might have been uh, um, feeding on or hunting some either snakes or, uh, or crayfish in that picture. 
Longleaf pine, look at these birds. Um, and I'm gonna play this sound real quick. And uh, if we can entertain me um, and see if y'all can guess which bird is making this sound. So would it be a prairie warbler, a red cockaded woodpecker, a blue grosbeak, an indigo bunting, or a yellow breasted chat? And here I go. So what do y'all think that was? Was it an indigo bunting? Was it a prairie warbler? Was it a red cockaded, a blue grosbeak, or a yellow breasted chat? We've got one woodpecker, yes, a couple of yellow breasted chat. So all right, so so that is a yellow breasted chat. Um, and for the individual that was asking about that bird where to find it. Uh, learn that sound, right? <clears throat> uh, it's pretty darn unique. Um, you know, maybe you could get it confused with a, uh, maybe a, a mockingbird, um, maybe a brown thrasher, just making some, you know, uh, crazy noises um, as they often do. But um, once you learn it, you can uh, differentiate it from, from all the other, other birds that might sound like it. But um, this is the habitat. Um, and I just found this in, interesting, um, you know, after, after I moved back down to South Carolina and, and got into birds down here, but um, there used to be around 92 million acres of habitat like this. Um, now there's around 4.3, uh, about 4 million acres. So around a 96, 97 um, percent decrease in, in that habitat. So, you know, you, we wonder why the red cockaded woodpecker uh, is endangered and the, and the prairie warbler is in decline. Um, you know, it's a, it's a huge loss of, of habitat. Um, but we still, we still have some of this in South Carolina, um, and it's going to provide or offer birds uh, that we uh, wouldn't see uh, otherwise. Um, you know, yellow-breasted chats you, you can find here and there. Um, but, you know, typically um, uh, the, the prairie warbler, a fantastic place to go to go find a prairie warbler if you haven't seen one yet. Uh, blue grosbeaks and indigo buntings, they, they like power lines. Uh, you can find them in other places as well. Um, you know, fallow fields um, at, a, at a farm, you can definitely find those. Uh, red cockaded woodpecker though, you know, you're, you're gonna find them in, in this kind of habitat only. Um, so really, really neat um, uh, kind of ecosystem habitat that we have right here in South Carolina. And it's gonna produce a lot of birds, a lot of woodpeckers, um, you know, some sparrows, you, you see all the uh, perennials and all the grasses there. There's a lot of cover there. Um, and there's places, you know, around here in South Carolina, uh, right, right here in Columbia, uh, where we're located, uh, that, that have habitat like this. Um, Harbison State Forest is a, is a decent place. Um, they probably don't burn as much as some wildlife management area uh, lands. Uh, but probably my favorite place close to Columbia to, to see habitat like this would be Watery River Heritage Preserve. So if you haven't been there, uh, please go, please visit it. It's a, it's a fantastic place. All right, so let's chat about the binoculars. Um, so 8x42 is the typical um, power that, that birders like. Um, 8 is just the magnification, so uh, you know, typically that, that just means that it's gonna make the image about eight times larger uh, looking through the binoculars than it would be, you know, just looking through it with your eyes. Um, and 42 is just the, the millimeters here. Um, and, uh, you know, 42 millimeters uh, allows quite a few, uh, quite a bit of light um, to come in. So in those low light conditions, uh, you're gonna you're gonna have more <clears throat> um, visibility in your binoculars if you have a uh, you know a larger a larger diameter right there. <clears throat> um, some people bird with 10 by 42s, um, which is fine. Um, they you know if you if you shake a bit with your hands, um, the image is going to be a little bit shakier. Uh, the 8 by 42s uh, it offers a little bit more I guess forgiveness there. Um, you're gonna have a wider field of view. It's not gonna zoom in. You know, on something that's uh, that's relatively close, you know, to too too much. Um, those those tens, the ten by forty twos, are really going to pull it in close. But with that, you're going to lose some of the um, some of the you know, some of your peripheral. So if that bird flits um, and it it 
you know, flew 15 feet away, you might not uh, find it as easily as if you would have had, you know, an eight by 42. A pair of binoculars. So uh, 8 by 42s allow a lot of light to come in. Um, you can find those birds a little bit easier uh, because it just doesn't zoom in right on them, um, but there's plenty of magnification to enjoy those birds. Um, it, 10 by 42s are probably used uh, most whenever you're looking at, at you know, far away objects. Um, you know, as a birder, you know, uh, if, if I wanted to look at something really far away, 500 yards or, you know, a few hundred yards, I'm, I'm going to use a scope. Uh, which is which is even offers even more magnification. Um, make sure you purchase a waterproof and fog proof pair. Um, I remember my father once I started getting into this, he bought me uh, my first pair of binoculars. They were fantastic. It looked like I was you know looking at things in in high definition, right? Uh, compared to the ones that he he had whenever I was growing up in his house. Um, but I was picking blueberries with the family one time, and I wanted to see uh, some birds that I was hearing. This was years and years ago and uh, they were foggy and uh, I was upset because I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't find these birds. Um, so I probably, you know, that week, I probably ended up by, uh, buying my first pair of uh, Nikon Monarchs, uh, which are waterproof and fog proof. Um, so they're not gonna fog inside. You, you might still get some of the fog from the outside, but that, that usually clears up relatively quickly. Um, but if you, if you, you know, spend 50 bucks on a pair of uh, binoculars, uh, you might be upset when you can't see that beautiful painted bunning or a yellow warbler um, or, you know, one of those rarities that we get here in South Carolina. So uh, binoculars are going to last a long time. So paying, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars for, for a good pair um, is a pretty decent uh, investment um, and, it, and it's a pretty good deal. Uh, so waterproof, fog proof, um, Nikon. Uh, Vortex and Celestron make afford affordable uh, optics. Um, I have uh, two pairs, right? What if uh, my five-year-old drops mine, um, even though I try to keep them up high? Uh, what if he gets to them and, and drops one uh, during spring migration? What am I going to do? Well, I'm just going to grab my other pair that I have for backup, right? Um, and, uh, you know, th th I've, I think I've had three in nine years. I gave my first pair to, uh, or my, I guess my second pair of my first fog proof and waterproof ones to my sister up in P Pennsylvania because she's getting into birds now. But I do have two pairs that I kind of um, go back and forth with and just have one as a backup. Uh, make sure they're clean. Um, bring some uh, a nice microfiber cloth with you. Um, there's something called a lens pen um, that you can just easily pop in your backpack or pocket. Um, and clean your optics if, uh, if they get dirty, um, and use them efficiently. So uh, I lead a bunch of bird walks, right? Um, and I can't see myself right now, but uh, hopefully y'all can, can see me. Uh, so whenever I, I'm out and I see somebody uh, looking for a bird and they're going like this, I always stop them, right? So they're looking for a bird and they're, they're looking in a tree, they're looking in a tree. Um, I always stop them, all right? I say, put the, put the binoculars down. And I say, find them with your eyes first, without the binoculars, okay? Look at all the peripheral you have without, without your binoculars, okay? When you put these up, you're limited, right? So look for that motion, okay? And when you find that bird in that tree, I'm watching the bird, I'm watching the bird, I'm watching the bird, it hasn't moved. I put these up, and as long as your eyes are on that bird, when you put up your binoculars, okay, like that, you should be, uh, if not right on that bird, it should be in the, the, the field of, of view of your binoculars. Um, and if it's not, maybe just move the, the binoculars uh, back and forth, just, just a hair. But if you don't see that bird um, in, a, in a few seconds, put the binoculars back down because it could have flown, you know, um, six inches or, you know, hop six inches or, or flown six feet away. Um, put the binoculars down and start looking for the bird with your eyes. When you see it flitting again, you know, that's when you put, put your binoculars back up while you're looking at that bird. So I see a lot of people that are just getting into this, um, uh, you know, trying to find that bird only with their binoculars. Um, don't, don't do that. Um, if, if you're looking at things that are far away um, and maybe just scanning, um, like the, the clear cut that we, um, uh, birded the other day. Um, gosh, we, I can't remember what bird we, oh, it was an orchard oriole, uh, a nice uh, juvenile one that, that doesn't, it's a, it was a male, so it has black hair and it's yellow and it doesn't look anything like the adult, you know, the, the mature male. Um, I was just scanning the little tops of these, these dead stems, um, limbs in this clear cut, and there it was. So, you know, that is one of the 
a uh, few times that I say, put your binoculars up and just kind of look. Uh, but when you know that there's a few birds in a, in a tree and they're flitting around, use your eyes first. And then when you get an opportunity that, that's clear, put those binoculars up. And, and I think you'll be a lot happier, you know, trying to find those birds and practice. Um, you know, put things in trees or just, just practice, play game and uh, try get, get, get efficient with these things. And you're going to see more birds. You're going to have more fun while you're out there. Um, use that peripheral. Um, it's really important. Soften your eyes a little bit. Uh, don't, don't be laser focused on, on a certain spot. Okay. Uh, you know, you see motion all, all over and take that into consideration, um, to, to find more birds. But I put these two uh, pictures up here. You know, the one on the top right looks like something that I would, you know, look or, or see whenever I looked out of my, my dad's uh, binoculars, you know, from the 1970s. Uh, but the one down here at the bottom, you know, that's, that's what you're looking at now. Um, I mean, they are just crystal clear if you get a solid pair of binoculars. So um, it's important. And Amazon is a great place to, to find them. Um, there's, there's a few stores, obviously, around that, that, that sell binoculars as well. Um, so some birding hotspots. I, I pulled this from eBird. Again, we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Um, but they have a hundred hotspots listed for South Carolina. Um, there's even more, but I think they limited um, their, their list to uh, 100. Um, there's really no order. I did, I did choose Huntington uh, Beach State Park because that is number one in South Carolina for species reported on eBird. So think about that, 333 species reported um, at that park. Um, if you want to see more seabirds, you know, think about uh, petrels and maybe uh, uh, Jaegers, um, you know, that might be your, your place to go. Um, shorebirds, herons, a lot of waterfowl there, a decent amount of sparrows and songbirds. Um, Bear Island, I'm going from the coast to uh, the, the upper state. So Bear Island, one of my favorite places to uh, bird. Uh, waterfowl can be spectacular spectacular there. So if you want to brush up on your waterfowl or see our beautiful waterfowl that we have here in South Carolina, you know, pintails, uh, blue wing uh, teal, um, tons of shovelers down there, swans, uh, just, just great, great birds. Um, but they also have a lot of shorebirds. American Avocet is one of the prettiest ones that they have. Um, birds of prey, uh, they have, uh, you can go on eBird and see when the barn owls are most active or when they're reported the most. Uh, if you've never seen a barn owl, that's probably one of the better places in South Carolina to, uh, to find them. Um, so a lot of birds of prey there. Uh, they have turns and gulls and, uh, you know, buntings they do pretty well with as well. Um, Santee National Wildlife Refuge, uh, the bluff unit, uh, around 256 species. We're, we're starting to go uh, into the state a little bit away from the ocean. Uh, 256 species, that's pretty respectable. That's a, that's a lot of birds, right? Um, great place again for waterfowl, herons, uh, swallows, uh, sparrows, and songbirds. If you can't make it to the coast, uh, to one of the, the, the ones that I just talked about, uh, you know, the bluff unit at, at, in Santee National Wildlife Refuge isn't, isn't a bad place to go. Uh, Congaree National Park, around 206 species, uh, herons, <laughs> can be seen there. Owls um, are, are there. If you can ever go on an owl prowl, uh, it's kind of eerie. It's kind of cool. Um, it's, it's, it's really neat. They have a lot of owls there. Uh, warblers can be fantastic, especially in the, in, before the mosquitoes come out. Um, and they can, you, can, you can get some really close views uh, there. And uh, loads of other songbirds. Um, Lake Conistee. <clears throat> so we're getting to the upper state now. Another great place for waterfowl, shorebirds, and uh, songbirds. And one of my favorite places to go um, is the South Carolina Botanical Gardens. Uh, there's, uh, I mean, the, the park is easy uh, to, to navigate. Uh, it has a lot of different, it has a lot of edges. I love birding edges, you know, where the woods, uh, where the trees meet, meet fields um, or some other habitat. Um, it has a, a small river or creek going through it, um, so you have some water there as well. Um, but it holds a lot of warblers, and you can see, see some really, really neat species there. And uh, I guarantee you, um, unless you're just a really, really seasoned birder, that you're going to pick up um, quite a few new species of birds if you, if you visit botan the botanical gardens. Um, mostly, mostly songbirds. If, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big warbler um, fan. Um, I just think they're little teeny jewels bouncing around trees. 
And uh, it's, it's one of my favorite places in the state to, to go after warblers. So um, remember, eBird has a hundred of these hotspots. I just chose, what, six of them to, to chat about, just kind of covering briefly, um, you know, places uh, that um, can produce a lot of birds here in South Carolina, but there's uh, plenty more, 94 more. So online resources, apps and, and books, uh, allaboutbirds.org. Uh, it's free. You can just pull it up and uh, you can just start learning about birds immediately. It's, it's one of the websites that I used um, whenever I first started this journey and um, gained a lot of knowledge from it. Um, uh, birds of, of the world, it used to be birds of North America. Um, I guess they thought North America wasn't big enough. So they just went all over the world now. So they have all sorts of information on, on all sorts of birds. It's 50 bucks a year. I think you can do, you know, three years for a, a little, little bit of a reduced price, but it's going to offer more scientific um, information. It offers fantastic information, um, but it also kind of gets into the, to the science of things. Um, and it costs a, just a little bit of money, but if you're really into it, it's a great, it's a great site. I probably did it for a couple of years um, and might do it again. Um, Birdcast, uh, which is on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, it actually uses radar to see when the birds are migrating. So you can literally go on there, click a date or, you know, uh, see what's happening that night that on the day that, that you're in and see if the birds are coming. So during spring migration, the uh, yellow, uh, the lighter it is, the, the more birds um, are in the area. So you can see kind of the middle of the country right there in that picture is, is really hot. Just in that one picture, that's just an example. Uh, so it'll, it'll give you real life uh, motion uh, at the radar uh, of these birds migrating. So, uh, you know, if you want to call in sick one day during spring migration, look at this first so you know exactly what day you're going to call in sick on, right? Uh, so really, really great, great tool. Uh, sometimes I have mixed feelings about technology, but boy, as a birder, that, that's a fantastic uh, techie tool. Um, eBird, we're going to get into in just a little bit, but one of the most important things that you can use to, to be, become a better birder, see more birds. Um, Merlin Bird ID, we talked about that uh, a little bit, and we're going to talk about it in the next slide a little bit more. Uh, the Warbler Guide, which is here on the bottom right, uh, great, great book. Um, again, I'm a warbler head, um, so it has, uh, we have about around 50, I think, seven breeding species in North America, and it's going to um, uh, talk about all of them, and it tells you where typically you find them in a tree or maybe on a ground, uh, what they look like in the fall and the spring if they do change. Um, uh, different characteristics to kind of focus on, looking at them from underneath to the side, all sorts of stuff. So really, really great book, and they have an app as well. I think it's uh, 13, 14, 15 bucks. Um, it has 360 views of birds, and uh, you can really uh, hone your your warbler IDing skills with that. Um, any any respected um, you know field field guide. Uh, there's so many of them out there that. I don't know. I, I think it's kind of hard to choose. Just just pick one that your eyes and your mind, you know, like. All right, so we're going to get into Merlin Bird ID real quick. So this is on, this is from my phone. Okay, these are just screenshots from it. Um, you, you just pull it up after you, you upload it and say if you didn't know what a, uh, a bird was that you were seeing. You just go to start bird ID. Okay, this is the first screen that you're going to see. It's going to say, it's going to ask you, where did you see this bird? All right, so I'm here in Lexington, so I put Lexington, South Carolina. All right, it says, when did you see this bird? All right, we're going way in the past, or are we going this current day? So it's May 21st. All right, then it says, what size is the bird? I, I just kind of played around with it. I put between a sparrow, okay, and a robin. And said, what color is this bird? All right, or colors, right? Uh, I just put blue, just to, out of curiosity to see what would come up. And it also uh, asks, was this bird or was the bird eating at a feed or swimming or waiting? Because uh, you're going to get different birds, right? On the ground, in trees or bushes, on a fence or a wire, wire, soaring or flying. So I just put in the trees or bushes. And all of a sudden, this is, this is the one that came up, but it also suggested 17 more, okay? So 18 species were, <clears throat> were suggested from Blue Grosbeak. That, that was their, I guess, the, most, uh, the, the best match. Um, to birds like Eastern Bluebird, of course, uh, Indigo Bunting, European Starling. Um, you know, sometimes when you see a, see a bird, um, even though the European Starling really isn't blue, 
um, you know, the, the light can play uh, funny tricks on our eyes. So it, it suggested that, you know, um, due to the size probably. Brown-headed net, nuthatch, really tiny bird. So why would it have brought that up? I'm guessing because, you know, the, the gray on the sides or on those wings can sometimes look blue. Um, and a brown-headed uh, cowbird, you know, the size is between a robin and a sparrow, which, you know, that's probably, probably matches a cowbird perfectly. And again, remember light, you know, kind of plays uh, tricks on us. Um, so uh, 18 species were suggested. And, um, you know, typically uh, for a new bird, this, this can be a really powerful tool. tool. And, and, and a lot of times it'll, it'll pick uh, or it'll, it'll suggest, suggest the right bird that you're looking at. Um, and something really, really uh, neat or interesting, I guess, about the, this whole quarantine, um, and I know people have suffered and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, we're in a terrible situation, but, um, you know, people are starting to, to bird. There was even a Fox News report about uh, people birding. Um, but the downloads of this Mer Merlin bird ID that I, uh, I have here um, increased 102% compared to this time last year. So. Um, I think I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm getting texts and emails from people that I would never have guessed were looking at birds. Um, so that's definitely a sil silver lining and uh, something uh, I think to be happy about. Uh, so that's Merlin Bird ID. It's a, it's a fantastic app. All right, so, you know, kind of indir indirectly, right? Uh, see more birds by helping birds. Um, I pretty much every time I lead a bird walk, I'm gonna talk about this coffee. Um, Birds and Beans coffee, uh, it, it's fantastic. You can see this sun-grown coffee right here. Uh, if you just imagine you flying from South Carolina, um, you're flying, you're a Baltimore Oriole that, that just finished breeding in Pennsylvania. You come to South Carolina and then you, you hop over to, to Central America and you come back. And this is what it looked like, you know, a shade-grown coffee farm, and this is what it looks like now. Uh, you don't have a place to, to stay, at least right there you don't. So you have to find, you know, either, either a, a natural forest or one of these shade-grown coffee farms. Well, birds and beans source 100% um, of their coffee from these shade-grown coffee farms. So if you ever looked at this video, um, there's actually coffee, coffee plants that are under these trees. It's really cool. Um, and uh, you're supporting the birds, you know, just by switching to a, a coffee that sources 100% of their beans from um, shade grown coffee farms. So uh, if it's sun grown, you know, the birds that we enjoy so much are, are gonna suffer for it. Um, so if we kind of change the way we're consuming, uh, we can kind of change um, the outcome to, to a certain number of these species. We have about 50 of them that use these, uh, 50 bird species that use these shade grown coffee farms in the wintertime that we see here in the United States. Uh, plant natives, uh, you know, I'm not gonna talk about it, um, you know, in, in depth here. I've, I've talked about it on, on some other uh, webinars that we've done, uh, but natives are gonna support more insects, especially caterpillars um, or butterflies and moths. So they're caterpillars and uh, that, that's a lot of food for, for the birds. Uh, goldenrod is pictured here and that's a host plant to over a hundred different species of um, moths and butterflies. So think about all that food that you're providing birds just by planting goldenrod. Um, buy a migratory bird stamp, um, also known as the, the duck stamp, okay? Um, it goes to a fund called the Migratory Bird Conservation Fund, um, and then it's distributed to, to the states um, that have uh, you know, critical, critical areas that need to be saved. Um, and uh, not only does it help uh, waterfowl, but uh, you know, think about Bear Island. Uh, it is a waterfowl uh, magnet. Um, and think about all the birds that are there. Uh, in February, I think, is when we had our walk. And probably we, we, we had a, a two-day outing, but total birding time was probably around seven or eight hours. We had 101 or 102 species, OK? So uh, you know, when, you, when you look out for the ducks, you're looking out for <laughs> uh, a loads of species. So 98% of the $25 that it costs you to um, acquire one of those uh, stamps uh, goes to land acquisition. Um, and our, I think over six and a half million acres has been um, uh, conserved because of the duck stamp sale. Um, and you don't have to be a hunter to buy one. As a hunter, I buy one, and as a birder, I buy one. So I spend, you know, 50 bucks a year on my two duck stamps. Um, but uh, think about all the, all the birders out there that haven't bought one that could 
be doing uh, some really good good work just through that twenty five dollars. Um, take someone out. Uh, gosh, this is me. You can't even see me. It looks like I'm a uh, I'm prey and and there are lions or something or hyenas. Uh, but I was uh, setting up a uh, bird box uh, this 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 past winter um, at uh, my son's daycare. And uh, yeah, you know, it's just so cool for me to see the the excitement and the enthusiasm and the wonder uh, in, in children's eyes. Uh, and so, uh, so take someone out, and it doesn't have to be a kid. Take, uh, you know, take, take your neighbor out um, that's never seen a scarlet tanager or a summer tanager, or maybe even a bluebird, um, and get involved. Uh, this is one of the trash pickups, um, or a picture from it, uh, that Shannon was talking about uh, before. This was in Columbia, and we, I can't remember the items that we picked up, but I think it was over two or 3,000 items um, that we picked up that day. And we probably had around 40 or 50 people. So it was a good, good uh, outcome of volunteers. Um, but think about this, you know, a buddy of mine took a great picture, um, sad picture of a uh, green heron. You know, green herons are migratory birds. They come up here from the tropics. And uh, it had fishing line wrapped around its, uh, its bill. So, uh, you know, was it able to make it? I have no idea. Um, so, you know, uh, getting, getting involved, uh, you know, cleanups may, may seem like a, a battle that we're just, we're, we're just fighting and we, there's no outcome, but uh, it can make a difference. Um, and just getting people to think about, you know, what, what they're doing with their trash, um, you know, is, is a good step. Um, and if you can't do it, if you're physically unable or just don't have the time, support us, please. Um, you know, so we can, we can organize more. Um, this time, you know, with the coronavirus and everything, it's, it's a little, um, we're, we're, we're kind of at a standstill, but uh, we will use that support uh, and the funds, you know, to, to do good in the future. So, um, you know, besides education and besides, you know, these, these trash pickups, you know, we, we have the advocacy part and, uh, you know, the conservation uh, side of things. Uh, so please support us if, if you're not already. Um, and if you have any questions about that, feel free to call um, Shannon or I or Sarah. And uh, right now, I would love to, unless, uh, you know, Shannon wants to ask me a question or two, but I would love to go to eBird and just show you guys how to navigate that so you can see more birds. So right now, we don't have any questions in the chat box. So I think, um, you know, anybody who has questions, go ahead and keep popping those into the chat box. Jay, if you want to and go to eBird. I know that we will get a little bit of user participation in there as well. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to stop share. And I'm going to go to eBird here. Can you see that, Shan? Sure can. All right, awesome. All right, so this is eBird. Um, and you do have to create an account um, if you want to uh, if you want to submit your sightings, right? So if I'm keeping up with the birds in my yard, um, I need to create an account, and uh, I just submit um, my you know the time that I just birded you know in my yard um, to eBird, and it keeps up with everything. So the cool thing about that is. You know, say if I have something, you know, like last year we had an eruption year, um, a lot of them of uh, red-breasted uh, nut hatches. Well, if I, you know, I've been here for six years, so I can look and look up red-breasted nut hatches in my yard and see what months they're usually seen here. So I can kind of prepare myself and, uh, um, you know, to, to see certain birds at certain times of the year, uh, even in your own backyard. So it's a really, really cool tool for that as well. But um, I love to go to explore. So you just click on explore here and it brings you to this page. I typically don't use explore species. Um, if I did that, if I put like say rosette spoonbill in, um, it would show me the state of South Carolina and all these dots where you, you've seen them and that's great, but it, it just keeps it to that one species. What I like to do is go to explore regions um, and let's just say, well, I'll just pull up South Carolina. So let's click on South Carolina here. And so you can see, let me minimize something, okay. So you can see South Carolina here, let's click on the map. And so all the, you know, it's shaded yellow and red and orange um, because those are all eBird uh, submissions. So when we zoom in, or they're, they're locations that people bird. So when we zoom in, we can actually see all of these locations that people bird 
And you can see here, species observed. Uh, we don't have any in the 500s here, but once you start going to places like Costa Rica, Colombia, and start searching there, you can, you'll see some red and that's, that's pretty incredible. But we, uh, you know, we have, here's, uh, this should be um, the state park, Huntington Beach State Park, 333 species. So it's starting to get that shade, that darker shade of, of red. Um, so if you're around Manning and you're like, whoa, I wanna, I wanna you know, find out where to bird, you probably already know, but you've got some great areas right here. You can click on, you can click on that, see Santee National Wildlife Refuge, that's the bluff unit, 256 species. Um, and then you, know, you can pull back out, if you're, you're, if you're taking a trip to Montana, you can pull out, okay, and go all the way out there and zoom back in and, and, and uh, see, see where the bird hotspots are. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the original screen here. Oh, South Carolina screen, and you can actually uh, break it down by counties, okay? So <clears throat> Charleston's number one, all right? So in Charleston County, uh, eBird submissions, or species submitted uh, and been approved, right? Uh, is 397, a lot of birds there. And then you go to, from Georgetown, all the coastal areas are gonna, are gonna have, uh, yeah, everybody's uh, jealous of the coastal areas, but they're gonna have the, the most species uh, naturally, right? Um, and then we start going all the way down to, I guess, uh, Bamberg there. So you can uh, click on, let's just click on Newberry, just pick a random one. So I'm in Newberry County um, and it's given me all the data that's been submitted for Newberry County, all right, since 1900. Um, and we can see some people that have been birding there, um, which, uh, uh, here's another tip. Uh, my wife and I went to Hawaii early um, February and I went on eBird just to study, uh, just to see what kind of birds I needed to, uh, uh, you know, prepare for. But I also found, you know, uh, someone, you can be public if you want, if you're, if you're in blue, I believe, uh, you can, uh, people, people can read about you. And you can also put like a email address. So uh, if you're going to a new place, say Hawaii, um, you can click on someone, they might have an e email address, and that's what I did. I emailed this fella and ended up just kind of hiring him um, as, a, as, as a friend, I guess, and a bir birder <laughs> um, uh, to, to take me out, and we had a, had a great time. Now, I, I, you know, there's, I guess, a word of caution, right? You never know, um, you know who, who you're going to you're gonna get, um, so, so be cautious of that. But um, if you're comfortable with that, it's a, it's a great way to meet people and uh, to, to see more birds. Uh, so we're in Newberry County right now. Um, so you can see the top birders there with the most species. But m the thing that I always look at, um, where in Newberry County are all the birds? Uh, so let's just choose the number two place here, Lynch's Woods Park, uh, which, is a, which is a cool little park in Newberry. It has a lot of warblers. Oh, look at me. There, so my name's there. Um, and that was a while ago. That was May 9th. Um, but, uh, you know, you can see what's been seen here by going to bar charts, okay? So, well, you can see what's been seen here, right here, but if you want to kind of condense it and see what months people are seeing birds, you go to that bar chart. So I'm gonna do that one more time. Okay, so we're in Newberry County, we're in Lynch's Woods Park. Okay, that was one of the hot spots in Newberry County and I went to bar charts after getting to this page. So bar charts one more time, and this is what I use everywhere I go. All right, so if I've never seen a yellow-billed cuckoo and I am gonna be in Newberry County, um, or I wanna bird in Newberry County, I'm gonna do what I just did. I see a yellow-billed cuckoo. What month are they seen the most? Well, look at this, May, uh, you know, and, and the larger green that you have here, the more times it's been seen, the higher frequency which it's been seen. Uh, so, you know, I know that, whoa, May is a really good month to go to Lynch Woods to find a uh, yellow bill cuckoo. Um, you can see that the red-bellied woodpecker, which is a, you know, one of our more, more common woodpeckers along with the downy woodpecker, it's pretty common, uh, you know, kind of throughout the year. It takes a little break here in June and July. It's probably be, uh, because people don't bird there because it's so hot. <laughs> Affiliated or uh, of course, I'd video. Um, 
brown headed nut hatch, white breasted nut hatch. I don't see a uh, breasted nut hatch. So that's that's a bird that they have not um, submitted on eBird yet. But let's go down to the yeah, you And you can see here, up. right? Spring migration. Okay. Okay. Is that better? Your screen sharing's fine. Your voice is just breaking up a fair amount. Ah, uh, okay. Um, it sounds sure. fine right now. We'll give it another shot. And then if it gets really scattered again, then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, you can see uh, a spring migration happening right here on this chart. Um, so, you know, a really, really powerful tool uh, to use to become a better birder. Um, and something that I also like to use, uh, so we have Newberry County pulled up. We can click right here on the map. Uh, let's just uh, put, put uh, click on the cedar waxwing, the map. So if I click on that, it's going to show me around Newberry County where cedar waxwings have been seen, okay? So obviously, you know, we're starting to get into Lake Murray here. So a lot of cedar waxwings have been seen. Uh, so that's just kind of a neat feature. Um, and you can also click on this, and it kind of shows you the frequency in which they are seen in there. So you can see there's a spike in April, um, and I'm sure they're around here, but probably not too many people are birding that time of year. And then there's a, there's a spike, you know, there. Um, not too many people are birding in Newberry County, so uh, there, there should probably be more um, visible right there, but not. Um, but let's back it back out. And I am going to go to different county. All right, and I'm just going to go to Lexington County. All right. And that's the county in which I live. And you can see that Saluda Shoals Park, if you're visiting, uh, guess what? You just found um, probably the birdiest, um, according to these numbers, right? Um, park or, or birding, birding park to, to go to here in Lexington County. So you click on Saluda Shoals Park and it lists the, the top 10. So Saluda Shoals, Archer's Lake, which is a great place to go find uh, waterfowl. Um, Timmerman Trail, which is a part of the Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve that I was talking about earlier, um, all sorts of places. And there's even more. You can click on here and it'll give you even more. It just lists the top 10, but right here it just gives you even, even more. So really great tool. So let's click on Saluda Shoals Park and you'll see, let's see, yeah, let me go to the bar charts one more time. So we clicked on Saluda Shoals Park after clicking on Lexington County. We're gonna go to bar, bar charts and it should pull up here in just a second. And you can see, you know, all the birds that have been uh, submitted on eBird at Saluda Shoals. So if you wanted to see a broad wing hawk, you've never seen one before, you pull all this up, you go to this chart, and you can see that April and maybe May, so definitely April is probably your, your best uh, month to try to find a broad wing hawk. Um, not just at Saluda Shoals, but probably in the area, right? In Lexington County, in the Midlands. Um, that's just kind of saying that they're, they're around, right? Harry Woodpecker, you can see that the green isn't as uh, prominent as, as it is for a downy and a, and a red bellied. Uh, but they do have hairy woodpeckers and they're um, seen regularly every single month. Uh, there's a little break here, but that's probably a combination of maybe the, the hairy woodpecker, um, you know, kind of shutting down a little bit because it's probably molting that time of year. And, uh, you know, people aren't burning as much because it's July and August. And then it starts picking back up uh, in the fall and the winter. Um, so let's just click on uh, Eastern Wood Peewee, the frequency. And you can see here, uh, all of a sudden, the, the, first, the end of the first week in April, people are starting to see them. And then it gets greater and greater, then there's a little drop, and then you know, a, a peak. And then you know, in September, October, you know, they're, they're really active. So 
Uh, if you've never seen one, you can look at that. And say, oh, okay, there's a pretty darn big window right here for me to find an Eastern Wood Peewee at Saluda Shoals Park. So you go back, um, and if you uh, click on that species, so let's click on Eastern Wood Peewee, uh, it, it takes to a page that, that talks about the bird. Um, and you can see all the observations, uh, and you can see its range. You know, there's like this invisible line where they don't like to go, uh, that they don't like to go past. You can see where it, uh, it winters, you know, all the way down to what, Peru, uh, uh, Bolivia, maybe the northern part of it. Um, and you can see photos. So it's, it's such a great tool. Um, and one other thing I wanted to tell you before we, uh, we kind of wrap up is you can print off a checklist. So Saluda Shoals Park we're in. So you can go to printable checklist. And look at that. Um, it's going to give you a list of birds if you'd, if you'd like to print this off and then keep it with you and then just kind of check the birds. Um, if you can't remember them, you know, while you're walking, if you want to check the birds that you're seeing, like look at all these warblers. <laughs> kind of hard if, if you had a great day with warblers and had 20 species to remember. So you can print this off uh, and, and uh, take it with you and just kind of keep up with the birds while you are birding. Um, and then you can come back here in your eBird account and submit it. And this information too is, uh, is kind of crunched by, you know, these ornithologists, these scientists um, to create, you know, maps to, to get a sense of the health of certain birds. Well, not certain, but all, all of bird species. So it's a, it's a huge citizen science project. You don't have to be a scientist. I'm not a scientist uh, to participate. Um, you'll meet people. Um, and you know, if you're competitive, uh, you know, uh, th it might motivate you to see more birds. Um, so <laughs> it's a great tool. Uh, I hope you, I hope you learned something. Um, hey, we've actually you... got a couple questions. Um, yeah. So first, Lee wanted to know if you could show how you got that checklist one more time. Hmm. Yeah, so let me start from the beginning. Let me just start from the beginning. Let me back out. All right, so I'm in South Carolina. Well, I'll even back out further than that. So <clears throat> I go to explore here, okay? I'm exploring eBird. This, this is brought up. So I go to explore regions. And I put South Carolina. So that pulls up automatically. And then, you know, I don't wanna print the checklist for the entire state right now, but I'm going to go, let me just go to um, hotspots. I'm gonna go to a hotspot. So I'm gonna to go to um, this one, Savannah National Wildlife Refuge, all right? And I've never been there before. Maybe this will motivate me to go there. Um, and then I'm going to go to printable checklist, okay? So last seen, first seen, high counts, bar charts, and that bar chart is what I use to, to see what's in the area. But printable checklist is right there. And then you've got everything you need to keep up with what you're seeing at that park. All right. And then the next question comes from Scott. Um, he said that when he's in his eBird app, he really only sees his data, but not the public sites and the mass general data. Is that something that you can really only see on the eBird website? Um, or is there a trick to using the app that might be helpful? I'm not, I'm not sure, Scott. Um, I, you know, I, I use the app. Um, I, I love coming back here and, and doing it by through the computer. Um, and I just always am, am studying the birds on the computer. Uh, you know, it's easier for me. Uh, so I've, I've actually never tried on the phone, but I will. And I'll, I'll let you know. Um, I just don't know, um, but I'll check it out. All right. Questions right now. Anybody have a question that didn't get answered or that you haven't asked yet? No questions yet. Um, the slides will be available, and assuming that everything went okay with recording, I will also have a recording of this as well. Okay. Lots of thank yous. Thank you from a novice birder. <laughs> all right. Well, get out there. I hope it was helpful. And thank you all, too, for, uh, for attending. Give just another second. Okay.
questions. Most of them, thank yous. Cameron did add that the app does have limited use and Scott, that is what I was gonna guess. Um, sometimes websites are just built a little bit better than apps. Thanks, Cameron. Um, Pam wants to know the difference between house and purple finch. So a house finch um, is not going to have as deep purple, okay? Um, and if you go, you know, before I even get into it, go to allaboutbirds.org. You can pull up a house finch, okay? Search house finch. And then when you uh, go to, um, uh, I guess the ID characteristics, you can, it'll suggest similar species. And you can, you can view them side by side. Um, and, and you can see the differences there. Uh, but, you know, the house finch uh, sometimes has, has just a, a, a barely a, a crest. It might have a few more feathers on its crown. Um, you know, I, I forgot which naturalist said it looked like you took the bird and dipped it in, in raspberry juice. Um, but it's going to be a little bit more um, red or purplish um, than a house finch is. Uh, we're not going to have them in the summertime or the springtime. This wasn't a great winter for house finch, or I'm sorry, uh, for purple finch. Uh, it wasn't a great winter for skins um, or a red breasted nuthatch. But um, you know, you see those birds in the wintertime. Go to eBird um, and see. Uh, I don't know what county you're in, um, but click on your county um, and uh, maybe a park that's near you and see when people are, are, are uh, submitting those purple finch. Um, sightings and you'll have a better idea when to start looking for them. But right now you shouldn't be getting a purple finch. Uh, they, they should all be house finches this time of year. And Nancy, to answer your question about when our next pro birder class is. So for those who don't know what pro birder is, we do offer a series of courses. Um, throughout the entire state in different habitat um, on birds. We are still not planning on doing in-person classes just yet. Um, our classes do attract people from all over the state. So uh, just for everybody's safety, we're waiting a little bit longer before we start doing in-person events. But um, we do have some great classes that we've got planned, um, talking about wildlife land management, about Carolina bays, talking about bees. So just stay tuned to our website. Um, and as long as you use your email that you check regularly to register for this class, we will be sending a newsletter next week with some information on which classes are coming up in June. So stay tuned. Um, thank you everybody for joining in. That's it for questions. Thank you, Jay. And You're welcome. I will send a wrap up email uh, with all the resources. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, reach out, reach out if you have any questions about birds.